I love you guys. <laughs> As is always the case, I will take your text messages immediately after the message. So through the course of the message, a question comes to mind and you want to ask it, and you don't want to uh, just stand up afterwards and ask it, feel free to just shoot me a text message. My phone number is printed in your bulletin. Or if you just want some clarity on the scripture or some random question about anything at all comes to mind, feel free to shoot me that question and we'll do our best to uh, try and interact with it in kind of a discussion format. For those of you who are visiting here, let me just say that pretty much anything goes during this time. So feel free to ask anything, no matter how crazy or silly it might be. As I said earlier, today is Pentecost Sunday. This is the time in the church season where we reflect upon the gift of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. It's a gift that has remained with the church ever since that time. On Pentecost, tongues of fire appeared above the followers of Christ who were gathered together in an upper room in Jerusalem. This was for them a tangible sign that the Holy Spirit had fallen upon them just as Jesus had promised. Fire appeared above them. Holy Spirit fire. And this changed everything. Throughout the scriptures, whenever something like this happens, it's a reminder of God's presence and God's power. It's a reminder that God is actively at work doing something new. And immediately after this incident, we get a picture of how this Holy Spirit fire shaped the life of the early church community. Our special song for today, Yellow Submarine, also paints a picture of a certain kind of community. It's an idealistic community that's bound together by the power of love and music. It's a community where, like the song tells us, everyone lives a life of ease and every one of us has all we need. It's the kind of place that, if we're honest, most of us would probably really enjoy living. All our friends are on board, and many of them live next door. And then the be band begins to play. We all live in a yellow submarine. It sounds like a pretty great place, doesn't it? Yeah, most of you. Most of you think it sounds like a good place. What I'd like to do at this point is invite Anthony to come forward and read today's scripture to us. And while he does it, I want you to consider the church community as a family and ask yourself if it's possible for all of us to live together in a yellow submarine. Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. The word of the Lord in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, as we now turn to your word, we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to illuminate our minds so that we can determine how these words might apply to us. And, and no matter where we may be on our own spiritual journeys, Lord, we ask that you would speak to us. And in so doing, convict us of our sin Show us how we can be more like you and make us restless, Lord, until we find our rest in you. This we pray to your praise and glory in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, if, like me, you've spent any time in church at all or time with people who profess to believe in the Bible, it doesn't take long to notice that sometimes people get all kinds of really crazy ideas from the Bible, which may or may not be what the scriptures actually teach. It can get really confusing at times. So one of the best ways in order to understand the true meaning of any particular text or story is to understand the context in which this particular story comes to us. What are the events leading up to this particular story? So we're going to look at that first today. What I want to do is, is talk briefly about Jesus to help us understand what's going on in this picture. Roughly 2,000 years ago, at the absolute perfect time in history, God did something amazing. He took on human flesh in order to provide the means through which humanity could be made right with God again. You see, just like today, 2,000 years ago, the world was pretty much a mess. Humanity, for the most part, had rejected the God who created it. 
This is the picture that Jesus enters into. This is the world that Jesus enters into. He takes on human flesh. It's what we call the incarnation. And for three years, Jesus teaches his followers all about the kingdom of God and how he himself was God's means of bringing redemption into the world. At the time, there were all kinds of ideas in terms of what this redemption might look like. Some of his followers thought that it would mean the establishment of a new political kingdom. Some thought that it might be done through the onset of a bloody revolution. But just as this redemption was about to appear, Jesus was captured and he was killed. All hope, it seemed, was lost. Now, in many ways, this reminds me of the end of Star Wars Episode 3, which is a movie I anticipated seeing for a long time, but I knew it was going to have a depressing ending, and it didn't disappoint. It had a very depressing ending. You see the Jedi Order fall, but most importantly, you see Anakin Skywalker, who in the first movie had been this cute little cuddly kid that you just wanted to hug and kiss and take home and, and, um, and hang out with. All of a sudden, he became the evil, wicked Darth Vader, and he killed all the people closest to him all of his friends, all of the fellow Jedi who were a good people who would try to keep peace and order in the galaxy. The very end of the movie, all hope seems lost. Darth Vader becomes covered in, in his black clothing and his face mask is put on and it seems like darkness has won. The end, the movie's over. Very depressing. Now, those of us who know the Star Wars story know that things don't really end there. There's three more movies that continue the story. And in the end, redemption becomes accomplished and applied in the life of someone as evil as Darth Vader. He becomes redeemed. And he kills the wicked emperor. Peace and order get restored to the galaxy at the end of the Star Wars story. It's not a direct parallel, I know, but you get the idea. Things looked bad for a while, but even in the midst of this bad set of circumstances, something good was happening underneath. Three days after his death, Jesus Christ rose from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. Things were not as bad as they seemed when they were most dark. This isn't science fiction. This is a real story. This really happened in real history. In fact, based on the standards that we use today to, to measure ancient history, this is the most verifiable event that happened in the ancient world. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus really rose from the dead. And then for 40 days, he continued to teach his followers about the kingdom of God and how he had just made redemption for humanity possible. This was indeed good news for everyone who heard it. People at long last could be made right in the relationship with God and order could once again be restored to the world. And then you're not going to believe what Jesus did. It's very surprising. He left. He ascended up to heaven. I can just imagine what this must have been like for his followers. He was dead and then he was alive and they were really excited. They thought they lost him and then they got him back again. And then after 40 days, what does he do? He leaves. He's gone again. They probably were just as confused as ever when this happened. But before he left, Jesus made a promise to his followers. He said, I will not leave you alone. He said, I will send you a teacher. I will send you the same Holy Spirit that raised me up from the dead. This is what Jesus told his followers in the Gospel of John, chapter 16. He said, starting in verse 13, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. In Acts chapter 2, friends, this is exactly what happens. Today's verses come immediately after the birth of the church on the day of Pentecost. It's on this day that the Holy Spirit came and filled the disciples of Jesus, just as Jesus had promised. Up until this point, his disciples really had no idea how they were going to carry on this great legacy that Jesus had taught them. To be honest, they didn't even really understand everything that Jesus had taught them for the previous three years. Not until they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And then it all began to make sense. When the Holy Spirit came, he came with power. And that transformed every single follower of Christ. Peter, the coward who had denied Christ three times, was now a changed man. Filled with the Spirit of God, he preached the first recorded Christian sermon 
and over 2,000 people came to saving faith in Christ. And many of these 2,000 people were the very same people who had been directly involved in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. But instead of screaming, death to Jesus, these people were now proclaiming that Jesus Christ had died in their place and had been resurrected three days later by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's an amazing transformation. It's a pretty intense message if you think about it. Jesus Christ, who happened to be the perfect righteous Son of God received in our place the punishment that we deserve for our rebellion against a holy and righteous God. He died on our behalf, but he didn't stay dead. And this is what the people proclaimed. He rose again, proving everything that he taught was true, and that he indeed was God in the flesh, the incarnation of the one true living God. All of that sets up the context for today's passage, where we find out what kind of community this particular message creates, or at least what kind of community it should create. Look at these verses with me. I mean, you have to admit, this is a pretty cool community. It says, They were devoted to the teachings of the apostles. This means that doctrine and learning were very important to them. One of the reasons that that most churches regularly recite creeds and confessions is because we know this is something the early church did as well. And it wasn't something that they did in a vacuum. It's something that through reciting these creeds and confessions created a change in lifestyle. It caused people to live and act differently. Because of their belief, they experienced strong fellowship, we're told, which is a powerful word, fellowship. It implies a community that's united on the deepest, most spiritual level. They regularly did things like eat together, and they regularly prayed together. All these things are great, but it gets even better, because as a result of living like this, miraculous things started to happen among them. Sick people were healed. Broken relationships with God, with others, were restored. Broken families found renewed strength once again. And then look at verses 44 and 45. It says, this gives us a real practical way in terms of what this looks like. It says in 44, All who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And then day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, I don't know about you, but this is the kind of community I would really love to be a part of. My guess is most of you would probably enjoy being part of a community like this as well. You know, I opened up by asking us this question, can we all live together in a yellow submarine. Why would I ask a question like that? Well, the the song, Yellow Submarine, the Beatles describe this perfect, ideal kind of life where they're surrounded by their friends all the time, they live a life of ease, and every one of them has all that they need. It sounds like a pretty good existence. But is this kind of existence possible in this world, at least for normal people, you know, people like all of us here today? Can we experience that kind of community? Can we experience that kind of yellow submarine existence? 